that the Sex Pistols with the anarchy in the UK. Welcome to Marxism Today. I'm Tony Schmidt. And I am Red Wagner. And today, we are going to be discussing uh, something that's actually been suggested to us uh, by a couple different listeners. Um, anarchy. Anarchy and the differences between anarchy and socialism or communism or Marxism or capitalism, I guess, too, is sort of intrinsically in that question. This list is getting long. Yeah. That's kind of a long list. I'll, I'll give my attempt at a good, brief definition of anarchism. So anarchism is a far-left position, if you want to go with the right-left political dichotomy, I guess. And anarchism believes in, I'll say, democracy and freedom, but not like in... Uh, well, maybe, I guess, in like sort of the idealized American freedom where there's nothing that uh, gets in your way to stop you from doing what you want to do. Under anarchy, you can do what you will. There's no law or government that will prevent you from doing it. And actually, normally, as a rule, there's no real laws or governments anyway, because any structure like that is corrupt and is always forcing other people's will upon people, and that's... From my understanding, really what anarchy is about is about not being forced to do things you don't want to do, allowing people to do whatever they consider the best thing for them to do. In my experience, anarchy is such an interesting word because it means so many different things to different people. I mean, we've talked about differences between us as Marxists on this podcast and the opinions of other Marxists. Any group has disagreements within it. The disagreements from one anarchist to the next are sometimes very, very big. You can find two people who are anarchists that agree on almost nothing. And I think that's one of the challenges with anarchy. I will say that when I was young... I often thought of myself as an anarchist. Yeah, me too. Because, one, the word is very appealing, right? It's, you know, you want to rebel a little bit when you're a teenager, and anarchy is, a, is maybe a little bit more rebellious than socialism. I'm not sure. But I think another big part of it was, uh, the, was basically, for me, punk music. Uh, because punk music will often specifically say the word anarchy. Uh, not just like the Sex Pistols, but there were a couple of local punk bands that I listened to in the area that, that would specifically talk about anarchy in their songs. And anarchy to them, and the way that they understood it, was something I could totally support and get behind. Also, one of the very first political books that I read was Noam Chomsky on anarchism. I think it was a collection of essays of his that talked about anarchism. How old were you when you read that? I was maybe 20. Okay. I mean, I really didn't get involved in politics when I was young. No, that's fine. I was just waiting for you to be like, oh yeah, when I was 12, I'm like, we should read some Chomsky. <laughs> yeah, no, I was not reading Chomsky when I was 12. <laughs> okay. I was basically, I didn't even know, I didn't pay attention to any politics at all until I was probably 17 or 18. I, I couldn't tell you one difference between a Democrat and a Republican at that point. Yeah, I could tell you who my parents know who would have voted for, but that, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I could have even told you that, honestly. Part of it was that my parents voted for different parties. So that was, you know, no. one was Republican, one was Democrat. So I think that was part of the agreement to not talk about it in the household, contributed to my 
uh, lateness in political awareness because it just wasn't a thing brought up in the House. Yeah. Although, here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Now, could you tell me the difference between Democrats <laughs> and Republicans? I, was gonna, <laughs> I feel like it's uh, full circle. <laughs> I was going to make a snarky comment about that, that... Uh, the more you learn, the more I realize my original position was not that far off. Yeah, <laughs> except instead of being born out of ignorance, it's born out of knowledge. Yes. And I would say that Chomsky, what Chomsky means by anarchism is also something that I have lots of agreement with. But I, I, wouldn't, I would not hesitate to call myself an anarchist in the sense that Chomsky uses it. The only hesitation I would have is that I feel that there are probably better terms, but I wouldn't say that I would hesitate because I have disagreement. And, and of course, those better terms being something like Marxist, which is why we chose the name we did for the podcast, which is Marxism Today. It doesn't surprise me that Chomsky doesn't pick Marxist, though, because he's not a big fan of Marx, right? No, I don't think he is. Well... At the very least, I think he's definitely not a fan of Lenin. And I think that he probably thought Marx is a little too close to Lenin and caught up in all that. And, you know, I think he comes from a little bit different background, too. But, but there it is. He, he prefers the term anarchist. Now, along those same lines, because I started by saying that people use the term anarchist in such wildly different ways... I think maybe I'll also mention the popular understanding of anarchism, which is that there is simply no government. People kind of envision this Mad Max-style world, almost. Yeah, whenever there's a riot, it's, quote, anarchy. Yes. Uh, because, and, and you know, there's a similarity there, because the, the sim similarity between the two is that the, those who propose... Um, anarchism as a kind of libertarian socialism. You know, that would be another term that I think you could use to describe Chomsky as libertarian socialism. Those who use it to basically as a synonym of that are defining anarchy in a way that says we don't want hierarchies of power. Right. We, we want people to have roughly equal power, and if there is a differential in power, it must be justified. Uh, you know, and, and held to a very high standard of justification. And those who use anarchy to say that it's just simply chaos, it's not that different of a definition, but because they... Be and, and this is why it's not that different of a definition. Those who use anarchy to say that it means chaos, they believe that without a strict hierarchy of power that you will inherently have chaos. That if, if somebody isn't bowing down to and oppressed by another group, that if you know, people are treated as equals and everyone's roughly on the same footing, that, they're, that society simply could not function that way. That that would be just awful. Yeah. And I think we should also note, um, Marx... Depending on how you want to read him with uh, interpretations of the state, could in a way be called an anarchist because Marx talks about the uh, eventual complete disillusion and no longer need of a state. Um, so, in a formal sense, you could call him uh, an anarchist like that, except I read it more as the disillusionment of the capitalist state or a state that is an uh, agent of repression mm -hmm. while still maintaining a functional state that helps helps to govern by what the people's will is. That's another interesting parallel between socialism and anarchism is the congruence in the definition of the state. Even Lenin, who probably most anarchists would not like, is somebody who defined the state as the tool of oppression that the rulers use against the oppressed. Uh, and, and, and we saw that when we read uh, State and Revolution. I think that this is a definition that anarchists probably largely agree with. 
they see the state not as a bunch of people coming together to organize and solve their problems. They might call that something else. They probably call that anarchism, honestly. Yeah. And the and when they say the state, what they mean is sort of this repressive mechanism that's used to force people to do things that they don't want to do. I'll just jump in with my critique of anarchism. <laughs> to uh, like their critique, I think is spot on for almost all anarchist uh, stuff I've read. Um, but it's I feel like when they speak about the state like Bakunin, I'll say, any formal state structure, whether it be repressive or not, is seen as just bad. He doesn't think you can really have an actual democratic state. And so, basically, all state is rejected. And while I'd maybe be open to experimenting with that sort of uh, thing if we ever have a revolution you know, to see what people want. I, in my mind, don't see a way that you can get rid of completely just basic administrative functions and, coordin and you know, coordinating, like, just the distribution of goods. Because if everybody's allowed to do what they want, which is fine, I'm not, I'm not against letting people do what they want, but if, say, you have farmers, and all the farmers can just do what they will, They'll just grow what they want, and maybe they won't grow enough. Maybe they'll grow too much, but they won't necessarily be able to meet the needs of everybody mm -hmm. in society without some sort of state to coordinate. In fact, that's basically what capitalism is. Is it's anarchy? I mean, that's another thing about anarchism is the free trade stuff is right wing anarchism, basically the laissez faire capitalism is a right-wing anarchism. So capitalism already sort of operates a bit on an anarchist-esque principle of production in that no one is forced to do this or that. They're all free to make what they will and how much of what they will. Um, except they're all doing it with the basis of making profit. But that's, that's my biggest problem and why I just can't accept anarchism as a thing that would actually work? You've brought in a couple of different definitions of anarchism that I think are important to highlight. One is the way that anarchism is tied to capitalism. There are a couple of Marx quotes that refer to capitalist production as the anarchy of capitalist production because the producers are not coordinating with each other. Within one firm, they are, but between firms, they aren't. And therefore, you have the anarchy of production, where if everyone decides to cut back on the production of a commodity, we could end up with a shortage. And if every firm who produces a particular commodity decides to increase production, we could end up with a, a too great of a surplus for that commodity. And, and and therefore we have an inefficient system. You know, that's kind of Marx's point when he talks about the anarchy of capitalist production. Along those same lines, anarchy has is a word that is sometimes claimed by pro-capitalists, like you mentioned. I think you called it right-wing anarchism. Some folks will call it anarcho-capitalism. Yeah, I've seen that. Which is very funny because, some, well, like I said earlier, there are some folks that use the word anarchism to mean something roughly equivalent to libertarian socialism. And those folks have probably very little in agreement with the folks who call themselves anarcho-capitalists. The people that call themselves anarcho-capitalists are coming from the stance that they believe no one should ever tell another person what they can and cannot do which I think has a lot of appeal, especially when you're young. It just in general has a lot of appeal. Yeah. Here are some basic examples, or at least one basic example that I think highlights this. You were mentioning the coordination of production earlier. You know, we might produce too much, we might produce too little. I think here's an even, uh, a, or just another way to think about it. What if 
we have anarchism and we say, okay, you can produce whatever you want and you can sell whatever you want. You know, it would, it would be authority to tell you that you can't. Well, what if it turns out the thing that you're selling as food is actually poison? It's got Ebola in it. Or you were growing what you thought were tasty mushrooms, but it turns out they're poison mushrooms. Or whatever. What a anarchist, especially an anarcho-capitalist, might tell you is, well, then when people get sick or when some people die, everyone will stop buying from that person. Okay, that's true, but what if the nature of the poison is that it's a carcinogen and it takes 20 years to kill you via cancer? It might be a little bit too late to figure that out. And, and even if people do, do you... You know, if it's not so direct, that feedback loop won't really be a functional one. On top of that, my stance would be, why do we have to worry about that? If that's the way you're going to handle it, is by people doing their research, being able to draw the connection between them being sick and having eaten your food, if we're going to rely on that, that puts a lot of pressure on the buyer, on the consumer, to figure all of this stuff out. Same thing with utilities, like city water and electricity. We could not have public water and not have electrical utilities and just have everyone come up with their own solution for that. And it might be that you can buy those things from a company you know somebody might set up a business where they sell you electricity but that's the kind of thing that to me what freedom means is the freedom to not have to worry about it I want to be able to turn on the tap and know that I'm going to get safe water I want to be able to flip the switch and have electricity without having to worry that the electricity company ran, went out of business or just decided to turn all electricity off to try to raise the rates on us or something like that. I think that practically what freedom means to human beings is the freedom to do the things we want and not have to worry about the things that we don't want to have to worry about. And I don't think anarchism is the right way to meet that definition of freedom. Yeah. At least not anarchism from the anarcho-capitalist point of view. Yeah. I guess I sort of jumped us right into critiquing anarchism. <laughs> I, I want to stress that, you know, I'm not... I'm much more okay with anarchism than I am capitalism, or at least left-wing anarchism. The right-wing anarchism, I just think, is really completely misguided. But I'm trying, I can't remember whose quote it was. Uh, but one of the, the big issues in Marx's day was him and, uh, I believe it was Bakunin, fighting for basically control of the International Working Men's Association. Anarchism and socialism fought over that and that was something that created a big divide on the left. Especially when I don't think there was quite as much sectarianism as there is today. Which is a lot today. But, I mean, that initially created a, a pretty big split. And there was a quote from somebody that if ever the red flag and black, red flag for socialism and black flag for anarchism, were to uh, come together, capitalism should be worried. And that is something that is intriguing and makes you wonder why it doesn't happen. Because as pointed out before on the podcast, the capitalists have just every different range and not even really related point of view together under the sun. Together, even the Republicans just have that. So I don't see why there's... There isn't a good reason to me why Marxists and socialists and Trotskyists and anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists and everybody can't just all agree that we need to get rid of capitalism and then have a big public debate to decide what we should try towards <laughs> after that. I think the best thing when it comes to anarchism, the thing that I think has a lot of value 
to offer is the anarchist critique against the author authoritarian forms of socialism. Yeah. You know, when we look at the Soviet Union and we see the hierarchy that was there, we see the failure, failure to offer really open elections and, and other limits of freedom, fr limits of freedom of expression and things like that. I think that those are extremely important critiques and that anarchism is very good at critiquing those things. I would say today I prefer to call myself a socialist rather than an anarchist, but those are things that I believe in as well. Sometimes I think the people who can analyze that point the best are the folks who identify as anarchists. But at the same time, I feel like the people who are best at understanding how to organize a world that's going to provide for all people are probably socialists. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think, I don't know, you could almost say social or anarchism is a bit more idealistic and perhaps a bit utopian than socialism in that they really want to stress freedom for everybody and non-restricted. Like a, mm -hmm. a good example of how I think that can get carried too far is that Emma Goldman has an essay called Majorities versus Minorities. And in that, to me, she sounds a bit like a capitalist because she's arguing basically against the tyranny of the majority, not uh, which is something that like the capitalists might say about the workers wanting to control everything. Mm -hmm. um, not that Emma Goldman was in any way, shape, or form a capitalist or even an apologist for capitalism. She was a very ardent anarchist. Uh, really awesome lady. There's a really good graphic novel by uh, Paul Buell that people should check out if they want a nice little brief introduction into the life of Emma Goldman. I mean, her argument in that is basically that even if it's a majority of people agreeing on something, that to force other people who don't agree with that to do that is wrong. And I think that's a very noble thing to say, but I just think it's kind of wrong. I think that you need to think about the particular situation that you're applying this logic to. Yeah. That there are some times when it's going to make sense. Like, let's say, for example, national health care. In the case of national health care, it's just far more efficient, far more logical to have a single-payer system, to have a national health care system where we all pay in and we cover everyone. And to let every single individual kind of make their own way on that would be a lot more freedom, but it's also a lot more work that you're putting on everyone to say you've got to figure out which plan to choose and which one's the best and how much you're going to pay and which provider you're going to go with and you know wade through all these metrics that people don't understand it's just simpler and easier to have a good system that everyone's in so that would be a case for kind of the socialist perspective but I don't think you can do that with everything. You don't want to have a one-size-fits-all solution to everything. For example, marriage. It would be an, an unjust society that ha defined marriage as between one man and one woman, even if that was the majority decision. That's a case where just because the majority thinks something doesn't mean that it makes sense to force the minority to do something. What we can take away from anarchism is to give people freedom when it makes sense. That, that if we're going to take away the freedom to do something, it needs to be for a very good reason. And, and like health care, for example, I actually believe that having single-payer health care would be giving freedom to people because it would be something that they don't need to worry about anymore. Yeah. That you've, don't worry, you've got your healthcare situation figured out. If you believe something's wrong with it, you can get involved with a movement to try to change it. But, you know, on the whole, you want healthcare to just basically be there and work when you need it. You don't want to have to worry about it when you don't need it. And it's kind of the same thing for the lights and the water. You want your water to run when you turn on the tap. You want the lights to turn on when you flip the switch. And... 
if we can make a system that's easy and efficient and just to do that, then let's do that as, as a one-size-fits-all system. Yeah, I think that makes good sense, which is probably why we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your favorite anarchist authors? Um, well, I've only read Emma Goldman in Mikhail Bakunin, and I, I like Emma Goldman a bit better. She's a, got a bit more uh, zazz, I'll say. Did you read, what was it, the essays on anarchism? Yeah, I just read a, a collection of, I think it's called Anarchism and Other Essays. It was just a nice collection of different essays. I read that by her years ago. Have you heard of Murray Bookchin? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've read a book of his, which is a collection of articles as well. I I found that I largely agreed with him. And of course, Chomsky. I've read Chomsky. Yeah, yeah. I I think um, there's a lot of good stuff to be learned from anarchists, and I also think we should really, really stress that we are not capturing in any way, shape, or form all of anarchism. Just like we don't capture all Marxist and socialist thought. So you know, if you are an anarchist and you listen to this, and we failed to represent your views on it, it's not because we are malicious or uh, just think anarchism is one little thing. We understand it's a lot broader, but especially for just covering it in a brief period, just cutting down a bit and simplifying. You know what they deported Emma Goldman uh, after uh, World War One Because she was not a born in the United States. So they deported her to the USSR with a lot of other uh, lefties. Well, because she's from, her family's from Russia originally. Mm -hmm. She came when she was a kid. And that's one of the things they did to get rid of lefties is they just deported foreign-born ones. Hmm. I did not know that. Or as America calls it, freedom. <laughs> Land of opportunity. If you have comments on anarchism... Or if there's something about anarchism that we didn't talk about but that you'd like to chime in with, you can post a comment on our Reddit, our subreddit that is, or leave us a message at our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Don't worry, folks. A badger is trying to dig through the wall and attack us. We're okay. <laughs>